Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. My name is Tegan Clary, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Unchained Labs. I will be your moderator, and I'm very glad to you have, you have decided to spend part of your day with us. Before we get the seminar started, I want to remind any of our customers joining us today that Unchained Labs is dedicated to supporting our customers through this challenging time. Please do not hesitate to get in touch with your local salesperson, an application scientist, one of our service engineers, or contact us directly at our website if there's anything you need. We're ready to do everything we can to help you. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. To ask questions, all you have to do is click on the little Q&A button in the Zoom navigation bar at the bottom or top of your screen and type in your questions. We will get to as many of them as we can. And now I'd like to introduce Greg Manley, one of our fantastic scientists. Today, Greg will take us through how the Hound platform can be used to track down and identify the source of particles that can show up in drug development and in manufacturing processes. And now I'll hand it over to Greg. Hi everyone, and thank you for joining me today. Since you're here, I would venture to guess that you're either currently working to characterize large particles, and if you're not doing it already, then you might be looking for tools to make it more tractable for your lab. Finding the right tools and establishing the most efficient methods are critical to making sure you can quickly get to an answer when it comes to particle investigations, so your organization can take the necessary corrective actions as, as quickly as possible, since these are definitely potentially very serious quality issues. Currently, uh, we tend to rely pretty heavily on visual inspection, and that helps us flag troublesome samples. But that isn't enough to do a full characterization, so you can determine what the particulate matter is and where it came from, so you can remove that <laughs> as a problem in your process. Now, from speaking with many of our customers who perform particle characterization and root cause work, I know it's pretty common to feel like your team has to be a little bit like Sherlock Holmes and Watson. You need to document, you need to isolate particles, you need to analyze the particular particulate matter, uh, all while making sure you don't lose track of the particle during transfer, during sample prep for a new instrument. You need a lot of different expertise to run the different pieces of equipment you might need to come up with that <clears throat> key piece of information that lets you identify that particle and track down its source. Today, I will be discussing root cause analysis, that is determining what your particles are and their source, and how Unchained Labs Hound instrument can enhance and simplify these studies so you can get an answer more efficiently and with a lot less headache. Now, why are we having this conversation today? Well, we all know particulate matter investigations are vitally important, especially when they, we get larger particles in the subvisible to visible side range. We all want to avoid FDA 483 investigation observations where we might be deficient in determining what potential sources of contamination are or having the investigative practices in place to determine the source. And even worse, and this really happens, is ending up with a, a product recall or an FDA warning letter due to large particulate matter uh, that really carries a significant financial and reputational cost. And unfortunately, these do happen. And there are cases, as we, we see here, that are pulled out of having the presence of glass particles in vials, uh, more glass contaminants <coughs> for material uh, present. This can you know, really slow your whole process down and, at the end of the day, impact what you're delivering to your patients. So the obvious question when particles appear, whether that's when you're developing the drug in formulation or you're performing your finishing and filling process and or an inspector flags a large visible particle is what are they? They can be things like protein aggregates. So from the sample itself, maybe it was this, the product was handled inappropriately. <clears throat> Perhaps it's polymer from packing or other material in the laboratory. Maybe there's a metal fragment that got carried through from processing equipment or a crimp cap, so a vial cap that got sheared off by accident. Or maybe there's a fiber and that can come from numerous sources from inline filters or even from, you know, potentially it's a lab technician's hair. <clears throat> As you can see here, these materials 
that are common contaminants in uh, biotherapeutic products cover a really wide range of potential sources, anywhere from the product itself to the packaging, to equipment used, to the laboratory environment. Not only can they come from a wide range of sources, they're just frankly different materials. There's really no one method that's gonna be able to go through and give you identity information on protein, metal, polymer, and fiber. It typically requires different pieces of equipment to get that information uh, to perform your root cause analysis. It's also important that you can begin quickly answering questions about the particles you find. The particles that you find will often lead you down different paths in your process. For an example, inherent particles, so particles that come from the drug API itself, like protein aggregates, may fall within established limits you already have. So within your following of the USP 1790, this might be data that just gets added to your trend data set and that can be completely fine. But if it's outside of the norm, it's a critical defect, an atypical particle. It's an intrinsic particle, something that comes from the packaging, excipients processing equipment, or even more severely, an extrinsic particle, as we look at our criticality chart. Uh, particles that come from the external environment, like hair, fiber, uh, rust, paint, other environmental contaminants, or insect parts, this might really raise the red flag where you need to start an investigation to track down exactly what this particulate matter is and even further where it came from. By implementing root cause analysis into your uh, routine investigations, you can get the answers to who, what, where, when, and why when it comes to the particulate matter. This will help you further your continuous process improvement and at the end of the day, ensure safe outcomes for your patients. Now, on top of the what is a question, which is vitally important, you need to know what that particulate matter is, we really need to expand our view a little bit when it comes to a root cause analysis. It's one thing to know that that contaminant is something like a cellulose fiber, but where did that fiber originate? And ultimately, how did it make it into the product or sample you're investigating? And that's the information you need to come away with to uh, improve your process and eliminate this cause of contamination. There's a wide range of potential materials, uh, but there's also a wide range of potential source of that material. Now, your lab or facility might have numerous sources of something like a cellulose fiber. Perhaps it comes from an inline filter you're using uh, in your process, or maybe it comes from a paper towel. Now, those cellulose fibers have different chemical compositions. They go through a different manufacturing process. So that's a pretty big benefit because then if you take the time to create your own reference library for the materials that you're actually using in your day-to-day -day work, you can pull out those differences when you perform different spectroscopies. So you can get unique fingerprints for the different <clears throat> source materials, uh, different equipment you're using through your, your production or formulation of your, your protein. And this is really key to having these kind of forensic clues that you can go through and perform this fingerprinting on to identify not only what the material is, but specifically where it came from. And then you can perform a little bit of a investigation to see how that product is being used and how it's introducing the contamination to your final product. When you're ready to begin your investigation, one way and one relatively common approach to run your investigation is to take a stepwise approach as outlined here with different levels. So level one would be the quickest but provide the least information, while level three requires more work but provides you the deepest level of information about the particulate matter you're interested in studying. As a first step, a level one investigation would allow you to document and analyze that particulate matter in situ by visual inspection, uh, perhaps use a camera to capture some images of that particle floating around in something like a, a vial or a syringe, and then maybe use an inver inverted microscope to get some higher quality images for your documentation. This allows you to catalog basic information like approximate size and appearance. If it's a common enough particle in your process, then there's probably a good chance that an experienced eye might be able to immediately have a, a really good guess at what that material is and perhaps where it may have come from. But this really requires additional data to build confidence and know for sure what that particle is and where it came from. 
level two builds on level one, but now you take that particle out of its the container it was sent to you in, isolate it on something like a membrane using membrane filtration. Once that particle is isolated, it's common to perform polarized light microscopy to get more detailed <laughs> characterization information, uh, more accurate size, shape, and, and color information about the contaminant under investigation. Now the final step, level three, is the most involved, but it also provides the most actionable data when it comes to a root cause investigation. Here you take that isolated particle, and if you have many particles, you can perform particle counting and sizing with membrane microscopy. microscopy. Now, where this gets to be a more advanced stage is you begin using spectroscopy to actually pull out identification information. So for organics, uh, protein aggregates, your small molecules you might be working on, Raman and FTIR spectroscopy are common approaches to study and identify these materials. Metals, on the other hand, aren't going to be Raman or FTIR active. So alternative approaches like SEM, EDS, or laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, LIBS, needs to be used to get data <coughs> on these different classes, class of materials. When you're at level three, this is where having your internal knowledge database and your internal references created for what these particles might be really come in handy. If you took that time to set up and know uh, the different sources of aluminum that may make their way into their sample, when you perform this level three analysis, you're gonna be able to, to match it not only to the type of metal it is, but the source material as well, if it's from piece of production equipment or from something like a vial cap. And that's really you know, what I wanna talk about a little bit today and how Hound enhances this level three analysis that you might undertake in your particulate matter invest. To help in your root cause studies, Unchained Labs offers our Hound instrument. Hound allows you to perform chemical identification elemental identification, as well as providing particle count, size, and shape. And this is all on a single platform, on a single sample preparation. So this really helps you if you have limited sample for that root cause study <clears throat> and limited time to go through and, and you really want to get data instead of wasting time preparing samples. Hound makes this a straightforward process where you can walk away with the data you need to track that particle back to its source. Hound accomplishes this by packing as much as possible into a benchtop instrument. With the latest version of Hound, we can provide up to three lasers in a system, two Raman lasers, either at 785 nanometers or 532 nanometers, to give you a lot of flexibility in your Raman experiments for chemical identification of organics, some inorganics, and things like your protein aggregates you might need to study. Now that doesn't cover the whole range of particulate matter you might run into, so we also incorporate laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy into our instrument. This gives you the ability to perform elemental analysis, and this can provide big benefits if you run into metal contaminants, glass fragments, or other compounds that either you don't get a lot of information from Raman or flat out are Raman or FTIR inactive. This whole instrument is built around a microscope base with custom optics and a high-speed sample stage. Since we have the microscope, we offer four different magnification levels, 5x, 10x, 20x, and 50x. So you can really get in there and examine your, your particles in high detail. Our 20x objective also offers a bright field and dark field mode, which can be really great to get good images or make sure you count particles accurately if they're translucent or white. To make sure you walk away with high quality images, we have a 5.1 megapixel color camera, so you can record those images for your documentation. Hound can be operated in manual or automated mode, and this really depends on how many particles you need to identify in your root cause investigation. If you have one or two, it's really easy to go up and use the instrument manually to collect the data you need for identification and matching. But if you have, you know, tens, hundreds, or, or thousands, you can automate this work uh, so it automatically locates where the particles are and then performs 
the Raman or laser induced breakdown spectroscopy, but kind of in, in either mode, you're either going to do this manually or automated where you go through and you look at the sample either prepared by membrane filtration or kept suspended in a wet cell to locate the, the particle either manually with the joystick using the computer software or automatically in an automated experiment. This allows you to get, perform your target selection for the, the particles you care about, identifying and get some size and shape analysis at the same time. You're able to capture images of those particles with any objective, our 5, 10, 20, or 50x objectives along the way for your documentation purposes. The combination of microscopy and Raman spectroscopy allows you to perform micro Raman analysis with either of the Raman wavelengths I mentioned, either 785 nanometers or 532 nanometers. Particles as small as two microns can be readily identified on the Hound system. When it comes to matching to a database, matching your unknown to references, we have built an in-house library for Hound, and it was designed to capture the types of contaminants and particulate matter you actually would encounter in the biopharmaceutical or pharmaceutical environment. Because we designed it this way, it's more limited. It's over 150 materials. So this gives you a course approximation. It's going to tell you if it's, if it's something like a cellulose fiber or if it's aluminum. And as I mentioned before, in a root cause analysis, a really important thing to help you actually track down that source in this investigation is to create your own references of the materials and equipment you actually use and could really be contaminants uh, in your product. We found internally and with our customers, this is the most valuable thing you can do uh, to really aid yourself to get to a quick answer in a root cause experiment. Think if you had a database of 30,000 materials and you had a uh, type of polyethylene. There's a lot of compounds related to polyethylene that would come up in a large database match. Now, if you had the polyethylene compounds in your specific lab and they had all their own slightly unique flavors when it came to Raman spectroscopy and the spectra that were produced, you're going to get a much quicker turnaround to your answer when you're using that unique reference library versus a generic reference library. So this is something that we really encourage and we've seen many customers have success using this method. So since that requires a little work and planning to get those references, we've designed the Hound software in an analysis package to make it really easy to acquire reference spectra and really easy to create your own unique reference libraries and search and match against them. Hound uses laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy in a similar manner to the Raman spectroscopy, but to identify inorganics and metals that can't be identified by Raman. If you're not familiar with LIBS, it's an atomic emission spectroscopy, and we can apply the same fingerprinting database search that we use for Raman. That's we're going to take, instead of Raman, a chemical fingerprint, we're going to take an elemental fingerprint, and we're going to run a Pearson correlation between the reference library and the unknown to come up with a match rank score anywhere from 0 to 1,000. With our laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, we can measure particles down to 20 microns. Below you can see an example spectrum, if you're not familiar, of an aluminum crimp cap. And the defining feature in the spectrum is the aluminum atomic emission peak. By combining microscopy, Raman, and laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy on a single platform, how lets you characterize and investigate the vast majority of particles you would run into realistically in your environment. The instrument can be used in manually when you have a few particles or in an automated mode when you have tens, hundreds, or thousands of particles. And having everything on, on one platform with a single sample prep, a single piece of software to use where you can switch between spectroscopies with a, a cliff, click of a button to identify anything from protein aggregate to stainless steel. And on top of that, the ability to create your own custom reference library easily could really help you accelerate the identification and work through your root cause investigation. So before I get to uh, a couple of case studies for how Hound has been used in root cause analysis, I, I just kind of want to outline a wit, one of the ways Hound could be used in this investigation. So what I have here is kind of a roadmap going from finding a particle down to identifying the root cause and taking corrective action, where I've highlighted where Hound comes into play in green. So once your particulate matter matters flagged, 
you deem that particle is atypical and requires an investigation, you want to get to the root cause at this point. If you're using the level approach, your level one documentation by in situ analysis, moving to level two, where you can isolate and further document by polarized light microscopy. I had this half shaded green because when it comes to isolation with Hound, we have a sample preparation kit where you can perform membrane filtration or isolate in a, in a wet cell. So it makes it easy if you are going to use Hound as a, your follow-up for spectroscopy to prepare the sample on our filter rounds, which are gold-coated filters that make automated Raman libs and also imaging of particles significantly better. To prepare the sample that way, perform your polarized light microscopy, and then transfer the sample to the hound instrument to identify that particular mat particulate matter, either by Raman or laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. On the hound system with a built-in reference database, if that's all you're using as a first, first approach, you're going to be able to identify what that material is. Is it polypropylene, polyethylene, something else? Uh, by running it on hound with Raman or libs, you get to understand the material composition. Now, when you take it a step further to perform your detailed root cause investigation and you took the time to either build your specific reference library in advance or you're pulling together materials to try to identify what that particle is at the time, you can add that library to hound, match your unknown to it, and when you find that match, your source material is known. So this is all done on hound to collect the spectroscopic information for identification and matching. So you know the material, you know the source material because you built your specific references. You can take that information and then perform, you know, kind of like an old detective work of going into the lab or into your facility and determining how and when that material is used. So if it's something like a, a vial cap, you know, you can go into the lab and see where it's used, what could potentially cause a fragment of that metal cap? Uh, is it during the crimping process? Is it dur during another handling step? Identify where that might occur. Now for root cause, you need to take an additional step and try to isolate where that is. Basically re reproduce the source of that contamination. And that might be done through rinsing or collecting material from that suspected uh, introduction source. Once you've collected that material, you can take that, uh, those particles back to Hound, and then you can get your confirmation that, okay, uh, we knew the source material, we tracked down, we talked to uh, the lab technicians or other members uh, running the production facility to find out where that material is being used. Uh, we isolated very similar fragments or fibers or particles uh, where it was being used in the process, and we have the same Raman and Lib spectra. So now we have high comp confirmation that this is the root cause. At that point, you can take corrective actions to make sure that that contamination source goes away and update your standard operating procedures. Now let's take a look at some real world examples, starting with how the Hound technology was used to find the cause of fiber contamination. Hound was used as a centerpiece in a root cause investigation to identify the source of fibers that caused multiple batch failures to occur. Uh, one thing I want to note here is that this was a previous generation of the Hound. Uh, currently, the, the spectra and the spectral presentation looks a little nicer than this, but I'm using this example because it really illustrates how Raman spectroscopy and Hound can be used as a key centerpiece to collecting the data you need to conduct a root cause investigation. You can see on the left an image of the fiber of one of the fibers that was causing batch failure. And next to it, you can see the Raman spectrum that was collected. The Raman spectrum allowed it to be identified as a cellulose fiber. Now, one thing stood out strongly, and that was a peak um, at around 1600 wave number. And this isn't common to cellulose fiber. It was actually unique. And this is what I mentioned previously about the power of creating your own unique reference libraries, because cellulose fiber can come from numerous sources, has slight differences in chemical makeup, that when you find a vibration like this in Raman spectroscopy, it can be a great way to use fingerprinting 
to go through and track down the source of this fiber. So that's when the hunt began, trying to track down fibers with that same 1600 wave number vibration. It was known that this was a cellulose fiber. So they went into their facility and rinsed the rubber stoppers, the clean and place equipment, and the tubing that were used and were thought to be potential sources of the contamination, or at least have carried through the contamination to those points of the process. So you can see a couple of fibers were captured by filtration, by filtering the, the rinse liquid. But unfortunately, none of these fibers had that unique peak and the unique vibration at 1600 wave numbers that was indicative of the fiber that was causing batch failure. So, you know, we have our unique <laughs> reference, a unique signature for the cellulose fiber. And uh, the first approach of going through and rinsing material to try to collect and identifying where it came from didn't work. So they went and needed to take a step back. And instead of searching kind of blindly throughout the facility to find where this fiber might have come, come from, they took some time to think of what cellulose containing materials do we have in this facility? And they created a unique reference library this way. So here you can see the multiple different cellulose containing materials were pulled from the lab uh, from different bags, uh, paper towels, down to what some of the technicians were wearing. You can see their sock, t-shirt, um, trousers, uh, different types of wipes that were used in the facility. <clears throat> References were created for all these materials. And as you look at the overlay of the spectra, you can see that there's nothing with that same peak as 1600 wave numbers that we're looking for for the fiber that was causing the batch failure. So this was a bit of a head scratcher. And unfortunately, this is how investigations can go. You're, you're trying to figure it out. Um, looking at the material or the equipment that was in place and rinsing it didn't yield a result going through and trying to think about all the material and equipment in the facility that contained cellulose and creating a reference didn't work out. So they had to take a step back. Maybe it wasn't coming from their facility, but maybe from the API. So the API supplier was asked to provide materials from their lab that contained cellulose fiber so we could create unique uh, references for them and see if any of those matched the fiber that was causing batch failure. So here we have some different uh, paper towels and some bags that were present in the lab. And what we see here in yellow is we have a winner, something that had our unique vibration at around 1600 wave number. That allows us to come up with a, a high confidence match between the unknown and this type of paper towel that came from the manufacturing facility. So at this point, a pretty high confidence that, well, you know it's cellulose fiber, you know it matches to a type of paper towel used in the production facility, but you need to, to close the loop and go to the, the facility and identify, well, where exactly did that cellulose fiber come from? Uh, so in talking to the, the members of the facility, it was determined that these paper towels were being used to wipe things down. So three of the tanks used in production were rinsed. And what you see on the left is the, uh, the rinse filtered onto a membrane. And you can see multiple fibers that were collected here. Now in the table on the right, when this was analyzed on Hound, we now have matches to the contaminant cellulose fiber. So these fibers had that unique vibration around 1600 wave number. So we were able to identify <laughs> it was cellulose, identify that it came from a particular type of paper towel due to the unique spectral fingerprint. And we we're able to confirm that, okay, these fibers were showing up in places you really don't want them uh, in the production tank. So now there's actionable data present. We found the root cause and action can be taken to remove this potential source of contamination in the future. With the root cause identified with the help of Hound and their investigative work, 
they are able to alter their SOPs for how the cleaning occurred so that paper towel wouldn't be introducing the cellulose fiber that was being carried through the process and causing batch failure in a different facility. Now for the final example, I want to take a look at, at LIBS and how LIBS can really uh, help you to dig deep. LIBS is laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy for the elemental identification. And LIBS really helps set Hound apart as an investigative tool in root cause analysis. Uh, so with Raman spectroscopy, you get identification of organics and some inorganics, but the LIBS really gives you access to a range of materials that you can't identify on other instruments like an FTIR instrument. In a LIBS measurement, a UV laser creates a plasma that relaxes back down to the ground state and produces atomic emission. The LIBS laser leaves a small ablation on the surface. You know, that means that some of the material is physically removed. Now, that allows you to actually have some benefit, and that is you can take multiple acquisitions in the same position of the sample to perform a surface analysis that's demonstrated here. Uh, so if you have things that have a coating on, you can basically move through the coating to identify the material that is located under. When you have these types of metal contaminants, they could often carry an outer coating, maybe a polymer is put around the outside. They could be painted. They could just be dirty or greasy. They could be oxidated. So what the LIBS does when you take multiple acquisitions in the same spot, it allows you to get the data on what that contaminant is, and then move past it to identify the material underneath. So this is just basically giving you a forensic tool to really thoroughly understand any uh, metal or any material that you can analyze on laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, and gives you a way to analyze more complex particles that have multiple layers. So I wanna use a penny as an example. So here, uh, pictured on the left, we have a penny that was cleaned prior to analysis. So the grime and, and dirt on the surface was removed and you can see it under 20X magnification in the image below. What we're looking at on the y-axis is the match rank provided by Hound. So this is a Pearson correlation between the copper reference in the database and the collected data times 1,000, so you have a score from zero to 1,000, and typically a score over 700 gives us pretty high confidence that that's a match. The x-axis is the total number of acquisitions, so this is taking a lib shot in the same position 10 times. So you can see for the first shot, we have a strong copper match, but is definitely lower than subsequent shots. So even though this was cleaned prior, there's probably some additional contaminants that were adding uh, some emission to the Raman spectrum that was interfering with the, the matching by the software. On shots two through 10, we see an incredibly high match rank that is maxing out around our maximum of a thousand. So, Things get a little more interesting when we look at a dirt. So now, instead of a penny that was cleaned prior to our analysis, here's something that you know came uh, fresh out of somebody's pocket. Under magnification, doesn't look as clean either. Now, we're looking at the same type of plot, where on the first shot, we have a very low match rank. It's under 100, so if this wasn't a penny where we knew the material it was made out of. It was some other unknown that you pulled out of your product. That might lead you down a completely different path than thinking it's copper. Um, that in no way is something you would call copper. But in taking a second shot, now we have a high match rank, and that's because the first laser-induced breakdown acquisition removed that surface dirt. The second had a more pure copper surface, and by the third, fourth, and so on, you are identifying copper. So with this data in hand, you have significantly more information about uh, the material you are analyzing. Now we can take this penny example a little further. Pennies are only coated in copper, uh, but are mostly comprised of zinc. With LIBS, you can penetrate the whole way to the zinc center, and that's what we, we see in the plot, where we're, the match score for to copper and the match score to zinc are compared. 
So again, the first measurement gives a little bit of a misleading result. It's under 700 and there's some contamination on the surface. On acquisitions 12 through 11, we have a high match to copper, which is what we would expect for a penny. Now on measurement 12, a spectrum is produced with atomic emission that has traces of copper as well as zinc present. So this is a measurement that's occurring at the interface between the copper coating and the zinc center. You can see a, a cross in the green and the blue traces in this plot. As we move past the interface on measurements 13 to 25, we're at a, a clean zinc center. So you can see with taking up to 25 acquisitions, we're able to go first through the grime to the copper coating to the copper zinc interface to the zinc layer is ablated at the point of measurement to where we're able to measure the zinc core. So I think it's pretty easy to see the benefit of using LIBS for identifying complex materials in a root cause analysis when it comes to metal or other particles you would like to analyze with LIBS. It just allows you to collect more information by performing a surface analysis so you can avoid making the wrong conclusions that you might make on a more limited surface-based data set. I hope the previous two studies showed you how Raman and laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy can aid in your root cause investigations. Hound is a frontline tool for performing these investigations. The combination of Raman and LIBS, as well as imaging, allows you to quickly switch between analysis methods without needing to transfer particles or prepare new samples. At the end of the day, the multimodal abilities of Hound and the easy to use software will just allow you to get to your answers more confidently and more quickly than before. Thank you all for joining me today. Uh, please check out our website for Hound. Feel free to email me if you would like some additional information. But before you go, I would really be happy to answer any questions that you have today. Uh, thanks again uh, for tuning in, and I, I look forward to hearing your questions. Hey, thank you, Greg, for that great overview of how Hound can identify any type of particle that may show up. We do have some great questions that have already been submitted. Uh, as a reminder, you can still ask a question by entering it into the Q&A section um, of your Zoom navigation bar. It should be there at the bottom. Um, Greg, let's go ahead and get started and answer some of these questions. Um, Greg, how long does it take typically to identify a particle using the Hound? Yeah, so in terms of, let me just describe what you would do when you, you had a particle identify, a particle to identify. You would isolate it and the sample prep on a membrane or another device that fits under the microscope. Uh, this is gonna take you in the, the minutes range, so say five minutes to get it on your filter. Then you can take it to the Hound instrument, uh, load up the software, and if it's a single particle, you're gonna be able to quickly find it under the microscope and collect the, the spectra. So in that process of getting uh, the particle out and starting to collect spectra, we're talking in under a half an hour. Now when performing a root cause investigation, a lot of this depends on that upfront work you did. Uh, as I discussed in the presentation today, spending time creating your unique reference library can save you a lot of time when you run into these crucial issues. So if you load it up in the Hound software with a few clicks of the button, that unique library you created, and then you run the particle, you might know immediately on the order of you know tens of minutes of where that uh, particle may have come from. Now in the case study where we looked at the cellulose fiber, they didn't have that reference library on hand. So their first approach was to kind of search around uh, the facility to find where it may have been. So now we're talking about days to collect the material, then identify it and take a step back to create that unique reference. So uh, I really like to promote, and we've seen just enormous success with our customers who have spent that time up front to have that unique reference library for the materials they actually use can really cut down on that time. So, you know, if you have a deviation and it's something you have to report, uh, to the FDA in that, that three-day time span, uh, that upfront work saves a lot of stress and lets you get to that answer much more quickly. Great, Greg. Hey, um, Greg, there were a couple of uh, questions about the sizes of the particles that you were showing. 
um, what, what's the range of particle sizes that the hound can handle and identify? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I saw the specific question about the size on the screen. So those are in you know, the tens of microns, but hounds can count particles down to two microns and higher, there's, as long as it fits on the filter or under the microscope, you, you can really image it. Uh, so the upper size range is high. The lower limit for imaging in Raman is two micrometers. For laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, because the laser spot size is a little bigger, that's uh, 20 micrometers. So down into the, the sub-visible range and through the, the visible range for the particles you would run into. Okay, a couple questions, Greg, on sample preparation. Um, so how do you, uh, during sample preparation, how do you prevent other particles from contaminating the sample during the analysis? So both before and during the analysis. Yeah, so a lot of, for sample preparation, we would recommend you put it in a hood with a HEPA filter to prevent particle contamination. So that's what we do in our, our laboratories when you're performing the membrane filtration or preparing uh, your wet round, uh, which is a, a wet cell to contain the sample. Now, we I frequently found people do not get cross-contamination by taking that prepared sample as long as it's, it's prepared in that clean environment and placing it quickly on an instrument that's outside of that hood. Uh, but some people, to reduce that risk, will also put the hound instrument uh, inside of a hood with a HEPA filter uh, to prevent it. Uh, this is all done in the, the sample preparation and um, really isn't too challenging to prevent any external contaminants from hitting uh, the filter. You know, one of the things steps you would take is to, you know, in our facility when we produce our filter rounds is we ensure that, you know, they're clean and particle free when we ship them to you. So Greg, right, regarding the filtration, right? So you, you mentioned that filtering um, particles uh, is a way to prep them. Um, other people have run into things like protein aggregates or silicon oil frequently um, that haven't worked well with filtration. How do you analyze those types of samples with the hound? Yeah, so that's, we have this second mode for sample preparation. Instead of cooling vacuum for filters, which can cause problems with things like protein aggregates because they could stretch or uh, deform or even break when you're cooling vacuum, especially something like the silicone oil uh, that was mentioned. Uh, those droplets can be pulled through the filter or spread out on top. So we have, uh, we call it a wet round. It's basically a wet cell where it's a glass slide backing where you can pipette a sample. There's a little spacer and a glass slide you put on top. And so this allows you to keep your particles suspended in solution if they're delicate and can't handle the vacuum filtration steps to prepare uh, a membrane filter. Great, Greg. Um, Greg, just a, a question about the, um, the older systems that we had in the new one, how, how does the current Hound instrument compare to previous generations of the instrument? Yeah, so if you're, you're familiar with the, the previous generations of the instrument, uh, something called the Single Particle Explorer is this new instrument that we launched last year at Unchained Labs is completely, uh, basically renovated and improved. The, the hardware has seen a significant overhaul, so the older instruments could only fit two of the lasers, inside and now you can have all three so you can have two ramen lasers and libs uh, stage upgrade uh, camera upgrade kind of the har hardware got a complete overhaul to build on what was successful for the single particle explorer customers uh, make it more robust and get higher and better quality data out at the end of the day the software is another thing that saw a complete overhaul we took the unchained approach of trying to make it as user-friendly and walk-up friendly as possible so using manual mode now, one of the great things, if you're not used to using a microscope uh, for analysis and using a joystick, uh, when I've trained new users, you know, on something like uh, a MALDI system or even on Hound, using that joystick, you, a new user kind of can jump around because there's kind of a fine touch to be able to move it, to move the stage appropriately, appropriately uh, to line up a particle. So to remove that type of even um, introductory burden, you can navigate a lot through the software to collect the spectrum instead of lining up with a joystick right at a laser crosshair. Uh, we have a mode where you, you click, I wanna click ramen, and then you move to the, the live image of the particles on the screen. You can click anywhere within that field of view, and then Hound's gonna align that particle with the laser, collect the spectrum, and, and move it back. So even at things of basically uh, collecting 
data are made really easy. And then to take it a step further, because you can run automated experiments on hounds. So root cause investigation, you're, you know, commonly we've seen people, you know, have a you know a handful or fewer particles they need to analyze. So that's really easy to do manually. Go up, click, collect uh, the data you need. If you have hundreds or thousands of particles you want to collect to get something like a chemically specific size distribution of the contaminants you have. Uh, we have an automated mode and that software works stepwise. It's going to go through uh, five steps where you input the parameters you need. It's going to guide you through so you can set up a successful automated experiment presenting you with the parameters you need to tweak and giving guidance. So, you know, if you use a certain type of preparation method, uh, we're going to pre-populate our recommendations for a successful experiment and you can tweak that based on your experience or your particular sample. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, hardware overhaul, uh, new hardware, new software to make things uh, easier and get your uh, better quality data out for your analysis. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, Greg, during LIBS analysis, how deep does the laser ablate um, at each exposure and can the depth be adjusted using that? Yeah, so what, what we've seen, we don't have a specification on the depth. So it depends a little bit on the material. Um, so you, you get a sense once you start working on it, how far you're, you're penetrating down. Uh, you know, we're talking in, you know, tens of, of nanometers uh, that you're going to be going down. Uh, but there's no exact specification on there because uh, we've seen it be material dependent. Okay, and Greg, the um, the match rank feature um, that you talked about, um, how can you just describe a little bit about how it works, um, and is it based on matching wave numbers? Yeah, so it's a, a Pearson correlation. So it's going to look at the correlation between the spectrum you captured and what's in the in the reference library. Go through and calculate it and compare it to everything that's in that reference library. It's most dependent on the wave number position and also has a smaller dependence on the peak width and, and peak intensity that's present. But it's, it's gonna go through, it's a quick method for fingerprint matching uh, between an unknown spectrum and a database. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, Greg, on the, on the sample preparation, um, just someone's asking here, can you elaborate a little bit on the sample preparation? Um, you know, how, how, mu how much I, I think is required, I guess, sample sizes? Um, and if there's mm -hmm. any um, chain, basically if there's any chamber or, or requirements for it. Okay, so, you know, what I would recommend is when you're preparing your sample to do it in a low particle or particle free environment. So in a hood with a, with a HEPA filter will be the best place to prepare it just to make sure you're not introducing external particular matter. Uh, the apparatus uh, with a hound, we ship a glassware set that's gonna give you a uh, support base to put the filter on and different size funnels. So that's really used if you have, you know, you're pulling from a vial and you need to collect a large number of particles. Um, frankly, any volume you can pipette and put on the filter and pull vacuum. So we're talking tens of microliters or smaller, you can pipette out, uh, put on to the membrane, pull vacuum and collect those particles. Sometimes if you have a large particle floating around, like something like a, a fiber, you can catch that on a little stainless steel hook. So you don't even need to pipette. So you really need no volume. You can just pull that fiber out and place it on uh, the surface of the membrane. And you know, one of the benefits of Raman spectroscopy that is that even if it is wet at the time, uh, you don't have water interference in a Raman spectrum like you would for FTIR. Uh, so you don't even really need to pull that vacuum and that's why you can use uh, the wet cell technology as well. So volume ranges down to, you know, a few microliters that you can pull out of your sample and put on and pull vacuum as long as your particles are present. The no volume of fishing out a sample. We've also worked in with customers who outside of the, the biopharma facility, somebody who's doing, uh, following some ISO guidelines for cleaning medical devices. Sometimes they have liters of material. And if there's a low particle burden that isn't gonna completely coat the membrane, you can filter liters of the uh, solution through our sample preparation apparatus and collect those particles. So a really wide dynamic range of volumes that can be used in sample prep. Okay, Greg, a, cu a couple of um, questions just on the database and reference system. So how does the Hound's reference system work? Um, and the, the person asking this question mentioned, 
they have an internal database already and their question is can they use it yeah so we make it really easy to create in our analysis software to collect the spectra you need and create a, a database we also make it really easy to export that data so if you are using you have an, a license to something like the biorad know-it-all database which i know is really popular you can take that data export it and use it in your external software or add it to what other um, you know broader all-encompassing database i know some of you have uh, company efforts to you know have this harmonized between sites that's containing different software so uh, to make how compatible with that we make it really easy to export in different file formats text file excel uh, so you can convert it easily to whatever format you need to integrate with your already established databases another question related to the uh, the database and building out databases um, the question here is we are working on a on building an image library of particles as well as spectroscopic characterization. Does Hound do anything to help us build that library out? Yeah, so uh, part of the, the software overhaul we did is we created a few different applications depending on the experimental result you wanted to get out. So it's really common to use Hound to want to collect Raman or Libs data either uh, manually or automatically. So there's applications that guide you through that process. Since we have a microscope with multiple objectives, bright field, dark field mode, we created a separate imaging application for applications like these. So I know some people are trying to feed these particle images into things like machine learning, uh, which is uh, really awesome. So you can collect images in our imaging application, and we have some extra tools in there to get you really high quality images. So, you know, one thing if you have something that's a fiber, uh, so that might be, let's say, three millimeters long, that's not, you're not going to be able to capture that in. Uh, high quality under magnification in a single field of view. So within what you can see in one field of view of something like a 50x microscope objective. So we have additional tools in our imaging application where you can basically drag and drop on the screen over your sample area that you want imaged. And uh, Hound will go through and automatically collect multiple images at that higher magnification, automatically fits them together. So you come away with <laughs> one beautiful uh, 50x image over several millimeters instead of over the typical you know tens of micron space of what that field of view originally takes so so yes we have um, an application built in there where you can take these high quality images out uh, even if it's just for a presentation you can get something that looks really nice but if you're you have uh, image database you're trying to build you can pull that these images out as well for that purpose okay greg and this is the this will be the last question to ask you so um i think this is relevant um in to today's environment uh, the question is, do we provide demos of the Hound system or sample analysis for customers? So how, how are we currently working with our with, with clients and, and with uh, um, prospective customers that are interested in the Hound to, to see data from the instrument or see the instrument? Yeah, so we're absolutely still doing this. You know, it takes a, some modification. So we can always uh, do a live stream of somebody using the instrument and going through the, the software uh, for a sample that you even send us that you want to see analyzed, we can do it that way over, you know, a meeting like Zoom here. Uh, we could probably even set up a Skype or a FaceTime type of situation if you wanted to see, see somebody actually physically using the instrument. Um, since we are an essential service provider and helping you all continue your work and continuing to uh, supply you with our instrumentation and consumables for people who are already using our products, uh, we can run these type of evaluations for you to get this in line because as you're developing things you still need to do particle analysis you know you still if something happens you need to identify what it is uh, so we will work with you to find a way that makes you comfortable uh, with what you're seeing from the instrument either through that uh, zoom meeting to see the software on a live sample uh, you can send us a sample for analysis in our lab where our um, application scientists will run it and we can discuss the results so it, it's really up to you to us to discuss if you're interested in that i'd be really happy and i think we you know we've done it in the past doing some of these streaming demonstrations and they've they've been successful so in the current time we need to take this um a slightly different approach and i think it'll work for a lot of people as i mentioned i've, I've done this over the past year with uh, two or three customers and it's, it's worked really well and you know hopefully we get back to the the usual 
in a short order and we can go back to a regular type of demonstration scheme. But uh, more than happy to work with you and you can reach out to me by email. And I just want to mention that a recording of this presentation should be sent out to you by email tomorrow. So if you need to see anything or uh, check my email at the end of it, it's gregory.manley at unchainlabs.com. And we can, I can work with you to get that evaluation set up. Excellent, Greg. Hey, thank you for answering all these great questions. Uh, and thanks for a great presentation today. Um, I also want to thank all of you who joined us live today. I think with many of us working at home these days, I know many of us at Unchained Labs are working from home. Um, some of our team is in the office as well, as Greg just mentioned. But I think this is a great time to explore new ideas and solutions to problems that many of us have in our, in our work. Um, if you would like to have a deeper conversation with our team about the Hound um, and how it can fit into your work, please do get in touch with us. Greg just mentioned how you can get in touch with him directly. Our team would love to connect with you over a Zoom meeting. We're all using Zoom. I think many of you probably are as well, but we're happy to get on a meeting one-on-one -on -one with a small group um, in any way you'd like to, to discuss um, the, the Hound specifically and some of the issues you may be having um, with particles. Thank you again for attending our virtual seminar today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.